Let that get out there. Find anything in chapter 10. 
Did anybody, uh, anybody else check on this? Well, let me give you my assessment of this, and I may be wrong, but uh, I think that this is a little bit of a prelude of what is about to unfold. And I'm not trying to say that Luke scripted in an imaginary story to just harmonize with what the big picture that, that uh, uh, Simon Peter is about to come to understand that the gospel is for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. I think it's a real story, but uh, Peter saw fit to in, uh, include this, and uh, it's really a pretty, pretty uh, timely when we think about. Let's just think of it this way: Simon Peter, he he hasn't. He's a Jew, and he's been with Jesus for three years, and he's a student of Old Testament Scripture, which, as we talked about in the previous class or two ago, the, the Old Testament Scriptures prophesied of a time when God would welcome all nations into his family. So, most all Jews should have known that. Had they read Old Testament from beginning to end with a highlighter, <laughs> they would have been able to circle, what does this mean, and why is it saying this? But most Jews didn't, uh, they had on blinders. <clears throat> and no doubt this was, uh, this was magnified by their own leadership who seemed to thrive on this divisiveness and this Jewish separatism is the term that students or good scholars use about the Jewish ideas, that they were better than all others, and others, everybody was a Gentile if you weren't a Jew, and, and they would be contaminated to be around the others. So over a period of time, that idea crystallized and came to be hardened and calloused where there was uh, just a, a great dividing wall. Uh, Paul alludes to that in Ephesians 2, where he talks about the wall of division between Jew and Gentile, which Christ broke down or eradicated. So when Peter goes to the house of Simon the Tanner, what I see here is, and please uh, don't, don't hesitate to speak up about this, the more I got to thinking about this on my own, Peter spent three years with Jesus. And here, here's the question, and maybe it's a little bit of a loaded question. Did Jesus ever break the Old Testament law? On the one hand, we want to say, no, he, he didn't sin, he wasn't sinful. But, uh, I guess maybe the way to make it unmotive would be to say, was Jesus ever accused of being unlawful? Yeah, everybody's head shakes there. So Peter had been under the tutelage of Jesus for three years. And, and, and as I thought about this more and more, I got, I got to thinking, and I, I went back and I just searched some, some of these scriptures. Let's see, uh, and I just stayed in Luke. In Luke chapter 6, verses 1 and Two, Jesus is accused of uh, unlawful deeds, and the unlawfulness is that he's eating on the Sabbath. And you could say, well, is that just a false accusation, or was he really? Well, you have to take that up with Jesus, because he ends up talking about how the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So whatever had uh, come to set in concrete, in, in, as far as the Jews' idea of the Sabbath, Jesus didn't seem to buy it. And, and he was labeled to be a, a, a real radical, an insubordinate, insurrectionist even, a lawbreaker. Well, if we keep going uh, later on in Luke chapter 6, a few verses down, he, he's in trouble because he violated the law, the Jewish law. He healed somebody on the Sabbath. And then if we 
you go to chapter 11, uh, this one is uh, Don. This one's rather picky. You uh, in Luke chapter 11, he's accused of a violation of the law, and why is it? Because he and his disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, this is not a uh, germ issue. It's a ceremonial thing, and on this occasion, the dis they didn't. They didn't go through the ceremony of washing their hands, purification, before they ate. They just ate. So there's another law that he broke, at least in the minds of the Jews. All right, so you get start to see the picture. I'm not done here. I've got a couple more to add to this, but you're starting to see if Jesus, if Peter spent three years with Jesus, <clears throat> and Jesus was his rabbi, his master teacher, and he witnessed Jesus doing this, <clears throat> does it surprise us then that he goes to the house of Simon the Tanner? couple more, Jeannie, and then I'll come to you and I'll do these briefly. And one of the big ones, Luke 5, 29 and Luke 15, 1 through 2, he's accused of eating with sinners and even patooing tax collectors. That was a major lawbreaker. And then the last one on the list that I just thought of on my own here, uh, this one is maybe uh, the, the most uh, uh, audacious in Luke chapter 5, and what is it, verse 20, he uh, heals somebody, but the way he heals them, he says, your sins are forgiven. Boy, if you want to set a light, under, if you want to light a fire under the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, then you, you go around and post as a human being and tell somebody their sins are forgiven. Stephen, uh, Jeannie and then Stephen. Well, was it against Biblical law to be a tax collector. <coughs> In other words, he, a, a, not a tax collector, a tanner. Could he become ceremonial, ceremonially clean? Well, that's a possibility, maybe. I don't know. I, don't I know guess that. my point is, was this against biblical, biblical law, or was it against, uh, it, it, my commentary says, Jewish law? In other words, Jewish tradition, maybe. Yeah, like like these other ones yeah. that weren't really scripture. They were said stone by the Christ. Point. And maybe that maybe it, it springboards or flows from a passage that talks about how it, it's uh, uh, sinful to deal with uh, dead animals, certain dead animals, and then all of a sudden you got all this embellishment on uh, man-made stipulations on how, how do you interpret that? Well, what does that mean? Well, surely it must mean you can't be a tanner. <laughs> so that's how sometimes Jesus wondered if it evolved that well, way. Just like, just like Jesus was accused of breaking law, which was actually not biblical law, yeah. which he would not have broken. Yeah. Uh, Good comment. Stephen? Yeah, I didn't have to say that Jesus was not breaking say it's law per se, but it is great the actual laws have been what happens, but um, I mentioned before, if I remember correctly, that the unclean animals had to do more with animals that had died naturally than yeah. had actually been killed. So you did say that. Tanner's business is with animals that he has to kill or someone else has killed and hasn't died has naturally. Okay. That, makes priests, it, that can make it a bit more. Priests kill the animals all the time. Yeah. So as long as he's not... Uh, Tanning where he broke kills. <laughs> no groundhogs on his racks. Terry, you're confused. Uh, you say Simon Peter was Jewish, but I don't know where to, where to find that. Simon Peter or Simon, Simon Tanner? Simon Peter. Well, Simon Tanner. Yeah. Uh, so. Probably the name Simon uh, lends itself to that. And. Uh, we we don't suspect that he wasn't Jewish because then it then it kind of if, if if he was we don't suspect he was Gentile because if it, if he's a Gentile then it kind of what's the whole point of Acts chapter ten? Right, because I was concerned. Did he know about Jesus before Peter showed up at his house or not? Or was there conversation taking place as to why he went there? What was the purpose of him going there? I'm not sure I understood. Did who understand about it? Did, did Peter talk to Simon Peter or Peter the Tanner? Did he 
know Jesus before? I, I have read that he was a follower of Christ himself. That uh, I, I don't know what, what, what you base that on, but uh, maybe it's just the, the rhythm of the movement of Peter and his travels. He goes to Lydda, and, and I don't know if Simon the Tanner had come from Jerusalem and had set up shop in, in Joppa. There seems to be uh, some connection. I don't know what it was. I don't know if the two knew each other from back a few years or what. Yeah, but we do. I think we're safe to assume he's a Jew, whether or not we would say he was a brother in Christ at this point. I, I have read that he was, but I don't know if you could document that too strong. All right, so uh, I don't want to get bogged down in all of that, but that, uh, I, when we closed uh, our last segment, I said uh, something to the effect of chapter 9 is basically the story of the conversion of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And chapter 10 is uh, basically the story of the conversion of Simon Peter. Uh, he's already a follower of Jesus, so I'm not trying to say that. But he is uh, now coming to see things even more clearly. And maybe he was already starting to catch a glimmer of that, uh, not only because of what we read in, about Simon the Tanner and his staying at his house, but he had to, he had to uh, begin to pick up, and, unless they were totally um, blinded during the three years they were with Jesus, they had to, you, you had to think uh, that they spent some time around the campfires at night or wherever they slept uh, with, uh, with them saying, Jesus, how come we could eat on the Sabbath? Or how come you were, why is it okay to heal somebody on the Sabbath day? Or why is it okay that we go to the house of the tax collector? Or you know, So they had to have discussions about that. And, and I, I feel confident that Jesus must have began to to open up their minds to the to the bigness of the gospel. Stephen? Just to clarify, it wasn't so much that they were eating on the Sabbath, it's that they were paying the heads off of grain or something during the Sabbath. They were which, working. Yeah, they were working by removing yeah. the grain and eating it, yeah. which it had been said that, which they had told the whole time, the Mosaic law, leave this part of your fields open for people to come and pick grain and leave it wherever they walk by yeah. so they're going to come grain. Or you do it ahead of time. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's pick up where, where we indeed left off, and that was around uh, Acts chapter 10 and uh, verse 23. <clears throat> I know some of you are probably saying he's so deaf he didn't even hear that, but I did hear it. I just chose to not make a big deal of it. <laughs> All right, so uh, God reveals a message by an angel to Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile, but he is uh, at least, uh, he is kind to the Gentiles, gives alms to the, Jew, uh, to the Jews, uh, I said Gentiles, I meant Jews. He's a Gentile who is giving alms to the Jewish community. And the text opens in chapter 10 by saying God heard his prayers. This is a good man. Now, we, we need to distinguish here. And sometimes people get hung up in the early part of chapter 10. And they just read where it says clearly, well, if you just read this, verses 1 and 2. Now there was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, and one who feared God with all of his household, and he gave alms to the Jewish people, and he prayed to God continually. If you stop there and I said, does that sound like, like Cornelius is in good standing with God? Well, you'd probably say, yeah, it does, actually. And especially when you read later on where it says God has heard your prayers. So you, you might come to the conclusion that he's in good standing with God. But the whole purpose of God sending the angel is to uh, send Peter 
for Cornelius to prepare the way for the arrival of Peter, and it's Peter's job to speak words to him whereby he and his household might come to be saved. So whatever conversation you might get into with somebody else about Cornelius, don't buy into the fact that he was he was he was in good standing with God and, and that he was a Gentile who, who, with whom God was pleased, but that's not saying he was a, in a saved relationship with God. Otherwise, the whole story of Peter's arrival uh, is uh, superfluous or uh, really uh, unnecessary. Why, why did he, if he's already in a saved state, why does Peter have to go speak words where he can be saved? That makes no sense. So, uh, verse 20, uh, later on in chapter 10, the first part of it, then almost simultaneously, while Simon, uh, while Cornelius is, uh, has met up with an angel, and the angel tells him about uh, Simon Peter being at the home of Simon the Tanner, and I uh, want you to send for him, and he'll come and preach. Uh, simultaneous with that, Peter is up on the rooftop at Simon the Tanner's, and uh, he gets hungry, and a, a big sheet comes down out of heaven, and it's got all kind of animals in it. And uh, a voice thunders from heaven and says, Arise and eat. And Peter peers over the edge of the, the sheet, and he looks and he sees uh, a mingling of uh, clean animals with unclean animals, and he, he kind of says, No thanks, not, I'm not allowed. And the voice says a second time, get up and eat. And Peter says, no, I'm not, not going. That's contaminated. That's taboo. And the third time, God says, don't, don't you dare call uh, something unclean which I have cleansed. A third time or a second time? Third time, wasn't it? No, second time. Second time? Yeah. Let me, what was that? Let, let me back up and see. Maybe I'm wrong on this. Verse 14, uh, of, of verse 13, a voice came, a rise to me, Peter said no means, Lord. And again, a voice came to him a second time, uh, what uh, God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And then it says, this happened three times. The next verse says it happened three times. So maybe I jumped the gun on the exact verbiage of the third time, but it was the third time that uh, I think Peter began to get the message and then he is, uh, he, he then sees a, uh, what is it called, the Spirit speaks to him in verse 19 and tells him, three men are looking for you, go downstairs and meet them and go without misgivings to the house of Caesarea, to the house of Cornelius. So, Peter listens to the voice. Cornelius heeds the, the message of the angel. So Peter takes off with nine others. They're traveling, there's ten of them. And I think they're traveling about 30 miles. So even if they just went 30 miles an hour, it probably took them a day, 10, 10 hours or so, to get there. So they when I say there's ten of them traveling, why, why am I making that up? Who are the ten? Jeannie, have you got a problem? Did I say something wrong? She and Debbie are laughing. I don't know if they're laughing at me or... I can't imagine I'm going 30 miles an hour. Did I say 30 miles an hour? Oh, okay. Three miles an hour. Ten miles. Uh, traveling 10 miles, no way. 30 miles at three miles an hour will take about 10 hours. Yeah, that would be moving along, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see, what was I saying? Sorry. I'm sorry. You were asking us how we knew there was 10 Oh, how do we know there were 10 of them traveling? There was Peter, and uh, Cornelius was told to send one of his captains and two of his servants. Am I right about that? So they go uh, to bring Peter back, and then Peter ends up 
I think wisely so we'll see this in chapter 11 when he has to uh, when he has to stand before the apostles and explain to them why he went and sat down and ate and stayed in the home of a Gentile uh, it would really be good to have some first hand witnesses so six men six brethren from Joppa and Linda, that's where I maybe uh, throw in Simon the Tanner as one of the brethren. So six brothers from Joppa travel with Peter up to Caesarea. And let's pick up then where the uh, verse 23. So he invited them. Peter invited the messengers from Cornelius in and he gave them lodging. On the next day he arose and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him, accompanied him uh, over in chapter 11, verse 12, it says there were six of them. And on the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And when it came about that, that Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter, being the first pope that he was, stuck out his hand and said, you may kiss my ring. Now, okay, I'm being facetious here, but really it is ridiculous how the Catholic Church has mangled this whole concept. They think Peter was the first pope. They're wrong about that, but even if Peter was the first one, notice what he, how he behaves. So Peter, Peter said to him, stand up for I too am just a man. I don't know if the Catholic Church would affirm that the Pope was just a man. I mean, I don't think people deny his human flesh, flesh and bones, but they see him as more than all right, I'm not trying to pick on the Catholics tonight, but uh, there's two things that we're, we're finding here in a matter of two, two passages. In chapter 24, Peter, uh, Peter is learning something uh, new about dogs. I'm having a little word play here. My mind is uh, weird the way it works. The Gentiles were dogs. And Jews would have nothing to do with dogs. But all of a sudden, Peter, who is a good Jew, goes into the home of a Gentile. He goes to eat with the dogs. And then two verses later, uh, if we can uh, change the wording a little bit, uh, Peter teaches Cornelius something about God. And he's not him. <laughs> Peter is not God. So Peter... I'm sure he's honored that he's shown such a welcome reception by Cornelius, but he tells Cornelius, you stand up, I am a man, I'm just a man, I'm not worthy to be worshipped. That's important, is uh, maybe uh, we, we might minimize both of those little points, but what we're seeing, this is a groundbreaking events in this chapter, that Peter would actually go and dine with Gentiles, not by mistake, but intentionally so. That's uh, not just groundbreaking, it's earth shattering. And no longer render them to be dogs. And really it's quite impressive uh, when we see Peter tell Cornelius, you stand up, I'm a, I'm a man just like you. This, uh, think how this begins to bridge the great divide between Jew and Gentile. Just on those two small levels. Dick? And you think of it, you know, life's a two-way street. Uh, Jews looked at Gentiles as dogs. The Gentiles, knowing that, looked down at Jews. Yeah. Here is the centurion. He's a man of war. He's a leadership position. And he bows down to Peter. Good and that is saying a lot for him. Yeah. All right. 
right, so Peter comes into the house. He's welcomed. Uh, Cornelius stands up, and then verse 27, as he talked with them, he entered and found many people. This is, this is just thrilling by itself, isn't it? I mean, I guess if you had met an angel, and an angel told you, send for Peter, and he's going to speak word, words by word, you, whereby you might be saved, you and all your household. You would not have to be told, why don't you invite your friends? You would send out a message to everybody. Your household would suddenly become huge because you would want for everybody to be here to hear me, a message whereby they might be saved. So Cornelius does just that. He evidently invites a lot. Many people were assembled. And Peter said to them, you yourselves know, you Gentiles know how, and I've underlined this word, unlawful. You know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit with him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Now that, uh, he had asked the question again, what, what was the real revelation of the, the sheet that dropped down? Peter captures the meaning of it here when he says, he, he, all of you Gentiles know that we Jews do not have fellowship with you. But God told me not to call you unclean. And that, that's why Peter could walk into the home of Cornelius. But that word unlawful there uh, is, uh, again, maybe let's put it in, in the same context as Jesus doing things that were accused of unlawful, of being unlawful. This one might even be stronger. I don't know. Uh, we, we should ferret that out sometime and see if we can actually find precise verses where it condemns a Jew for associating with a Gentile. That would be worth our studies too as well. Uh, verse 29. So Peter says, this is why I came, even without raising objection, when, when I was sent for. And so I ask, for what reason you have sent me? Now, Peter already knew a little bit of that because the messengers said that God told them, told them that the angel told Cornelius to send for Peter so that he could speak a message to him. So he knew that he was going to go there and give a message. And uh, so Cornelius then said, Four day, and, and all of this is, is recounted with great precision. Four days ago, to this hour, he says, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, which is around the three o'clock hour. And behold, a man standing before me in shining garments. This time he says a man. Earlier, the text tells us that it was an angel that appeared, which might tell us that uh, angels often appear in the form of men, maybe with a certain aura to them, a certain shining uh, that may have made you think uh, that they were something special. And he said to me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard in your alms. Now this one, I, I noticed it says your prayer. And I don't want to make too much about that. Your prayer, your prayers. But was there a certain prayer that he was praying? Could it have been that Cornelius was praying to Jehovah God saying, enlighten me, you know, help me to see. Your prayer has been answered and your alms have been, remem been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. You stay at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. Luke is uh, fabulous about giving us details. And uh, I think even uh, today, if you toured the Bible, then Stephen, you could stop and see the house of Simon the Tanner. I'm sure it's exactly. Right Wouldn't that be a statement that convinced Peter? Because Peter would be thinking, how do you know where I will stay? Yeah. How do you know all this? Yeah, that, that's a good point, Rick. 
So Peter automatically, when he hears Cornelius saying all of these details, he knows that either Cornelius is psychic or that he indeed has been visited by God by, by means of an angel. And so Cornelius says, and so I sent to you immediately, and, have, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, wait, uh, from a preacher's point of view, I just think about how, how delicious this is. Uh, Cornelius says, now, therefore, we're all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. We're ready. Preach, brother. Tell us. So, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly now uh, understand now, implying that something has changed. He understands something at this point in time that he didn't previously understand, and he's going to tell us why the now. He says, I understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Now, we're not just talking rich and poor here. This is a national, nationality thing. That, in other words, God is not one to only show his love and kindness to the Jews. He goes on to say, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And again, let's not confuse, this is redundant, but let's not confuse God smiling upon somebody who does right but uh, that doesn't mean they're saved. The, again, the very reason that Simon Peter comes is to preach so that they can be saved. So verse 36, now listen to the, as, uh, listen to the, uh, as I emphasize a couple different words here. If, if we back up to verse 35, but in every nation, in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching priest, peace through Jesus Christ. And then he says in parentheses, Luke, uh, Luke has uh, Peter saying, uh, he is the Lord of, can you finish it? All. He is the Lord of all. That's not just a good uh, word to use in a song because you can maybe rhyme with easy. He's Lord of all, meaning not just the Jews, not just the sons of Israel, but it, it's for every nation. And then verse 37, you yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea. Uh, Peter is... Uh, Peter is giving the gospel here, but it's a gospel that it's rooted in a historical Jesus, not just a, a symbolic risen Lord. Scholars get hung up in debating about this. Some say, well, no, the, the image of the Messiah as a risen Savior is just kind of a symbol for what God is. It's so hard to follow what some of these uh, liberal scholars are saying, but, but the scripture, the, the gospel that we read in scripture, it's full of details and it is certainly full of the history of Jesus. Uh, I mean, we don't, we don't derive from passages like this that Jesus really was just a made up uh, character in a, a big cosmic novel about how God redeems man. He's real. Verse 28, you know of Jesus of Nazareth. He's not just Jesus, a fictitious, made up kind of a Messiah. He's Jesus and he lived in Nazareth. And, and how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And then Peter adds, and we are witnesses of all the things that he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they also put him to death by hanging him on, my translation says a cross. Does anybody say a tree? I've been 
bit of providence for those of us here. Yes. King James, your such tree. Actually, the literal word there is wood. Hanging him on wood. Uh, so you can see where it would, would lend itself to either. But I think Peter is recollecting from Deuteronomy here where cursed is the man who dies on a tree. So he's bringing uh, the theology of the cross into things here. So he was put to death by hanging him on a tree. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should become visible, not only to all the people, but to witness, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. So even post-resurrection, he was not some apparition. He was a human being. He could walk with them, talk with them, they could touch him. He ate and drank with them. How many days after his crucifixion did, did Jesus appear to others before he ascended back to God? Forty? Over a period of 40 days, Luke tells us at the beginning of uh, Luke's Gospel. So, uh, verse 42, and we're getting close to quitting the point here tonight. And he ordered us to preach to the people, meaning the us here, the apostles in particular. He ordered us to preach to the people and to solemnly and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And we'll, we'll close. Uh, well, let, let's go ahead and just. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to get into 44. I'll wait, wait till next week. And you can study a little bit ahead about that because uh, it, it's a little uh, confusing. Uh, we still haven't studied from Acts 2. We're going back there. But in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit falls upon the believers, the apostles, and they speak in tongues. And then Peter preaches and says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But when we come to the household of Cornelius, they're going to receive the tongues, but uh, they get the Spirit before they get baptism. It's reversed. Let your little hamster spin that wheel for a while and see, see if you can make sense of that. If there's any sense to be made of it. I mean, maybe I'm making them out of the whole bit. So we'll start there at 44 next, uh, next week. And we'll, we'll talk then about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to finish up chapter 10. And, it, it, normally I would say we'll move on to another conversion story, but I want to move into chapter 11 because it really uh, reaffirms some of what we've been looking at in chapter 10. Any uh, uh, comments or questions before we close here? Okay, Keith. Verse 38 is interesting. Verse 38. Yeah.
Yeah, I remember. So God had control of the devil even before that, before 78 AD. Well, yeah, Jesus began. Remember, Jesus said on one occasion, I saw Satan fall from the sky. Yeah. So Jesus uh, began to uh, take dominance over Satan even before the full consummation of the age of people so saying. People were impressed or hard put. Yeah, and that, by the devil himself. Well, and you, you or, the power of evil, the power of Satan, however, was, that, that's one of the hardest questions to answer simply. I mean, when you say they were oppressed by the devil, what are you wanting me to say? That well, you know, he took out. Satan was walking around with a pitchfork. Word of mine. I mean, that's hard to say. I'm sorry, Mark, what are you saying? With how many spirits he brought out in the and put them into the pews, which they brought food. Legion. So many. Uh, now, one, one more comment on this. One more comment on this. It was quite common among that culture to even attribute, uh, not, not just outright demon possession, a lot of times, or some of our modern translations will say somebody suffered from epilepsy. But the, the, the point I'm making is that a lot of these, whether it's a paralytic or a blind man or uh, someone that really was possessed by some kind of influence that made him crazy, all of it seemed to be attributed to the devil. So that we have to be careful there that we uh, we understand the culture of the Bible and the mindset of, of the people in that time period because sometimes uh, people will uh, transpose that that idea to our day and age. So what that means in the minds of some, if you get cancer, it's because you, you're a sinner, and you know if you've got some problem. Um, it's because of sin. And we're not denying that we're all sinners, but um, I think a lot of things were just, everything was everything wicked and evil was attributed to uh, Satan quite often. And he was, uh, was one of the most powerful angels in heaven before he was ousted out of You know, let's not go there. <laughs> I'd like to know what you based that on. I mean, uh, that, we're not going there tonight, but that's another study that is really hard to grasp. Yes, it is. And it's uh, very tenuous. It's only that uh, theory is based on just a couple verses that maybe have been misinterpreted. Okay, thanks so much uh, for your <coughs> participation. And Stephen's going to see the leaders of the song or two. A song. Okay, so tomorrow night, the Women's Group that was being at the Wildlands will be meeting here, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't go to the Wildlands, come here. That's at 6.15. Uh -huh. Okay. We have a pastoral Sunday this Sunday, a special uh, offering. Vic will be giving our sermon, a pat on the back or a kick in the pants. I'll go by the pat on the back of the kick. But, uh, just two quick announcements. Uh, one, I went down to see the people about the permit. If we put a cement patio in, I was talking to the guy, and he's nodding his head looking at me going, now, is this an improvement on landscaping? I said, uh, yeah. He said, you don't need a permit. Uh, the other thing was Sunday, about 7.30 or so, I got a call from Howland Arms telling me they sent the cops out here that the sensor went off. 12.45 that night, I got another call, woke me up out of bed, telling me the alarm went off and the cops are out here. The next night, at 2.45 in the morning, I got a phone call from Howland Arms telling me the same thing, they sent the cops out here. And that, I, that, I had it. So I called them up and I said, listen, I want someone to meet me out here. I want to find out what's going on. I'm going to correct it now <laughs> before the cops start charging us. And, you know, I, I appreciate you calling me, but, you know. So at any rate, they sent a guy out and it was the shed that was setting everything off. 
and, and we looked on the shelf, see if a mouse was left droppings crawling around here, set the sensor off water, couldn't find nothing. And uh, I said, look, that thing's got to come down. I want something else. So he, I'll show you outside if anybody wants to see it. He installed a uh, thing on the door, okay, on the main, the big door. So it, it's going to stop that problem. But when he was taking that sensor down, he opened it up. We found three ladybugs in there. So he thinks it might have been a ladybug crawling around. Oh, <laughs> I said, so this little cute ladybug cost me all his sleep. I saw your truck here and someone here yesterday. So that's what we were doing. Okay. Well, I'm downstairs cleaning my cobwebs down. And Sean said last year, when we were gone, there's a cobweb. And when the furnace would go on, it would blow in front of the motion detector in the basement. So now I gotta keep my cobwebs clean. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt everything for this one. It's, 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 it's good to know, you know. What I mean? <laughs> so, but still, if you have to use the shed, still shut the alarm off. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know how I got to be the person that called anyway. Well, that's another story. I, I figured. You're the person that has the first crown that has the authority, so. <laughs> okay, so um, we're also meeting Sunday night, correctly? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, October sixth, uh, we're having a men's breakfast at nine. Yes. Went to Grace at ten. Okay. Both here. Uh, they will be here, the one will be over there. Okay. Try not to get the food and the uh, yarn mixed together. It won't taste very good. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, yeah. Uh, fall Fest coming up on the 14th. Sign up sheet back there. Flyers, send them out. Uh, the less, the more flyers you get up, the better that means because uh, pretty much if not, I would use them all on scratch pads and tell them all not. Yes. Remember, they also need donations of candy. And yes, donate, yeah. Trinkets. We need some donations for candy, trinkets, things like that. And we can also probably, uh, do we still need volunteers to run certain things too? Mm -hmm. Okay, so volunteers for overseeing various things. So, so keep going with that. Keep that in mind. Okay. Anything else? Okay, number 678. Number 678. First three verses. And then Mark, can you close this out, please? <clears throat> more about Jesus, Lord, I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving
also like to put it in the belly. 